Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome you to the first service on this Sunday morning, but also the fourth service of the last few days. I was joking with somebody beforehand that if I accidentally start sliding into my Christmas sermon, um, just somebody wave me and remind me to get back on track for today. Um, these last few days uh, have bled together, but in a great way. Our opening hymn today is going to be hymn number 34. As always, the order of service is printed for you in your service folder. We'll start then with hymn number 34. Now sing, we now rejoice. May God bless our time in his word. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning we ask that our God and Father would lead us to rejoice. For the birth of his Son in the flesh has set us free from our old bondage under the yoke of sin. May his nativity bring us joy today and always. May his birth, death, and resurrection inspire us to shine with kindness and compassion. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today, we come before the true God because of the mercy to us in Christ. Lord of life, I confess that I have sinned against you. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts, words, and deeds of which I am ashamed but some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask for your forgiveness. Deliver and restore me, that I may rest this night in peace. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We live now in his peace and rise each new day to serve him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn number 46. Hymn number 46, Your Little Ones, Dear Lord, Are We.
Our first scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8 through 10. The Lord speaks to the prophet. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson for today comes to us from the Gospel of St. Luke, Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If, this is how God, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things and your father knows that you need them but seek first his kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well do not be afraid little flock for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom this is the word of the lord Having heard the word which brings faith, we now join in confessing that faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's printed for you on page 5 in your service folder. Please stand. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn 442, hymn 442.
Grace, peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. A lot of people enter the new year with hope. Some people will enter the year with fear and trepidation. Some will enter the year with a mixture of both, hope and fear. The transitions sometimes can be nerve-wracking major life transitions, even when they're good. Most grooms I know are a little nervous their wedding day, maybe even a lot, because it's a big deal. Most pastors I know are more than a little nervous when they get to their first church and they're ordained and they're sitting there and they've spent their whole life as a student and now after getting there and, and still essentially being a student and having the, 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 the circuit pastor and the vacancy pastor, you're still running things, all of a sudden, halfway through the service, they basically do this. All right, here are the keys. Here you go. And you turn around for that first time and go, oh. Transitions can bring fear, trepidation, It's an interesting thing how, how that works. Again, even in under good circumstances or, or, or joyful-ish ones, uh, about a year and a half ago now, this is crazy as it sounds, how quickly time flies, about a year and a half ago now, when we, after that lockdown, had and were getting ready for our first in-person live service for a couple of months. I'll be honest, I was a little nervous. I didn't really like preaching to an empty room, but all of a sudden you had people in the room again. And on top of that, I was a little bit nervous. All right, is anybody going to show up? (laughs) Fear is a real thing. And transitions can be a frightening experience. We're about ready to go from 2021 into 2022. And there are people who after the last couple of years could be forgiven if they're sitting back a little bit cautiously, wait and see maybe even less hopeful than that about what 2022 is going to look like. And we have to at least allow for the possibility. Could 2022 be worse than 2021? Sure. In theory, yes, it could. It could be. But even if that were true, We still don't need to be afraid. Be not afraid, our Savior reminds us, more than once in Scripture. Our Gospel lesson this morning, he said it, do not be afraid. After the resurrection, he told the disciples multiple times, do not be afraid. And through the Apostle Paul, he encourages us this morning again to not be afraid. Our text from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. For this reason, Paul writes to Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me of his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. That that word there in verse 7, timid, it's another word for fear, right? Someone who is timid is 
nervous about something, fearful about something. If someone is, is, is timid about doing uh, some sort of athletic thing that they just don't know if they can do, that means there's fear there. If a person is timid about going on that first date, I mean, there's fear there. If that person is, is timid when it, when it comes to making a life decision, it means that they're probably afraid of what could go wrong. Paul here, when he's writing to Timothy, is writing to, on the one hand, a peer. Timothy is, is a pastor like Paul. But Paul is also the older and wiser mentor. Timothy is still pretty young, at least by the indications and hints we have in Scripture. And Timothy also seems to be one of those guys, again, by the hints we get in the Scripture, somebody who's of a more gentle spirit, who, who's not one to go out and pick a fight. Paul is not afraid to say something. Read his letters. If he sees something wrong... Does Paul say something? Uh-huh. Sometimes very bluntly. Timothy seems to be the type that is much more inclined to want to have peace and have people happy and, and be joyful and, and just get along. Which can be a really good thing. Except when there's important things to say. And then sometimes that peaceful nature can actually get in the way of the truth, that, that timidity can get in the way, it can cloud truth because you're afraid to say something. It's, it's a human thing we, we do see in Scripture very often that fear does cloud truth. It, 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 it just, it, it, it can put a shadow on even if you don't mean it to because you don't want to upset the apple cart. You don't want to rock the boat. John 12, yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. Okay, I'm going to help you with some of those pronouns, context, right? This is John 12. This is close-ish to Jesus' death and, res death and resurrection. This is getting close to Jesus' crucifixion. And the Pharisees are getting more and more openly hostile. And Jesus is continuing to do what he does, which is preach and teach. And it seems like he's gaining an ear among at least a few of the leaders. Probably most famously would be a Nicodemus. But Nicodemus, like some others, seems to fall into this category. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they love the pra human praise more than praise from God. And, and John's judgment there is, is, is a little blunt there at the end. But you can see it, right? And maybe even relate to it. They believed. But believing would have a price. And, the, and they could be in, and put out of the synagogue is the Jewish way of saying excommunicated. <laughs> And that scared them. It scared them enough to keep them from saying anything. It scared them enough that many probably remained silent. There were probably a few of those people there Good Friday evening. And they remained silent when the rest of the Pharisees and Sadducees condemned Jesus to death. Joshua 1.9. Centuries and centuries before. Joshua, right? Joshua in the battle of Jericho. The picture we have of Joshua in the Bible is somebody who is clear, decisive, and bold, right? He's Moses' right-hand man through the entire wandering through the wilderness. He's the general. He's the leader. And, but what does God say here multiple times to Joshua at the beginning of his book? Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And that's not the only time, this isn't the only verse that God says words like this to Joshua. Don't be afraid. 
transition, right? They're getting ready to leave the wilderness and go into the promised land. They've lived a mostly, maybe not overly pleasant nomadic life, but a, a, over, a, a generally peaceful nomadic life for 40 years off by themselves in the wilderness as a people. And now they're getting ready to transition into the promised land, which is going to bring with it conflict. Don't be afraid, God says. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Be not afraid, God says. He's with you. Be not afraid, God says. He walks with us. Be not afraid. His power and his spirit are present with us. Don't be afraid and let that fear cloud the truth of what is going on in our lives, that God is present and with us, never leaving us, never forsaking us. But then what about that second half of what I have here? How does it promote suffering? Fear, that is. It's because it's a short bridge. It's a short bridge from fear to anger. And it's a short bridge from anger to hatred. And if you want to see any confirmation of that, just look around in our world right now. There's a lot of very scared people. And it's a short bridge from fear to anger. There's a lot of very scared people out there. You can see it in the news articles. You can see it in the editorials. You can see it in the, in the stories that are on CARE 11 or WCCO. There are a lot of scared people out there. And it's a short bridge from fear to anger as people in fear start yelling at each other, why don't you care? How come this isn't a big deal to you? And that fear is fear, whether it's, it, it's fear of an illness or whether it's fear of government overreach or, 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 or fear of violence or, or, or fear of oppression. And it comes out so easily and so quickly in anger. And then when people are really afraid and whether intentionally or not, somebody stirs up that fear, that fear very quickly becomes an anger that turns into a hatred toward those who just don't care. These people are stupid. And when fear goes from hate anger into hatred, bad things happen. And again, we know this. We see it all too frequently in our world. When fear goes from anger into hatred, very bad things happen to other human beings because the thing about fear turning into anger, which turns into hatred, is that it also ends up stripping, stripping the object of a person's hatred of their humanity. Why should I have to love this person? They're a dope. Why should I have to care about this person? They're just, they deserve what's coming to them. This last week, whether you agree or disagree vociferously with his policies, this last week, Governor Walls announced that he has COVID and it didn't take me long to find in the social media comments more than one person making the rather harsh comment, something to the effect of, oh good, maybe we don't have to worry about him getting reelected in a year. Harsh. But hatred does weird things to people. Fear and anger do things to people. <clears throat> Fear clouds truth. It promotes suffering. 
Psalm 37 has this to say, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. Psalmist there is not unwise. The psalmist here is, is actually making that direct connection, right? Do not fret, it leads only to evil because it can very quickly lead to anger and wrath. Most revolutions start because people have started afraid and then have been riled up into anger. Most great evil starts when people are made afraid and then are riled up to anger and hatred. Your classic example from the history books in the last hundred years still remains Hitler in many ways. Starts with fear. Look at what these Jews are doing. They're terrible. Which then stirs up people into anger. Oh, they're taking our jobs. They're taking our money. And then short bridge leading to anger. And look at the evil. Terrible evil. Terrible evil done to other human beings. By the way, as a somewhat tangential observation, Christians in general should, would be wise to be on guard against political leaders who tend to default to motivation of fear and anger. If the primary motivator of a politician in terms of getting voters moving and voting and, and rallying, if the primary motivation is fear and anger, be careful. It can lead to bad things. An angry person, Proverbs 29, stirs up conflict. And a hot-tempered person commits many sins. Yeah. Uh, remember um, a, a number of weeks ago, we, we did a little bit of talking about this little thing in your brain, this little almond-sized gland called the amygdala, and when that thing really fires up, logical thought processes go out the window and you kind of go into survival mode. Strong fear will do that. Life and death situations will do that. Anger kind of does that too. Anger, if you've noticed, tends to shut down logical, rational discourse. When people are truly angry at each other, are, there, are they being thoughtful in their words? Typically, no. Turn on your classic talking head debate between two political operators from the opposite sides, and you will see this. I mean, they get riled up, they get angry, and you sometimes sit back and go, what are we doing other than just throwing wild haymakers at each other that sometimes make sense and often don't? An angry person stirs up conflict. And a hot-tempered person commits many sins. This is why we need to be careful with fear. This is why we need to be very cautious with, with anger because fear, short bridge to anger, short bridge to hatred, short bridge to really, really bad. Praise God, though, that we don't need to be afraid and that Jesus gives us every reason to leave our fear at his feet. Praise God even more that our Savior himself is not afraid and he doesn't hate us. And therefore we have hope. One of the things about the Christian faith is when it's deeply rooted, you see, I again, made this observation before, you see this really strange peace sometimes in a person. I know one pastor who has stage four pancreatic cancer. Really bad. But he's also one of the most, right now, in this exact moment, one of the most hopeful and optimistic people I'm aware of. 
It's a crazy thing what the power of the Spirit can do. Where Christ dwells, hope is even in the dark. Where Christ is, hope dwells, even when things around seem crazy. When Christ dwells in you, there's hope and peace. Even if the world around you seems like it's losing its mind. With the Spirit, and with God's love, and with God's grace, you can sit back. Because you know what God has done for you, you know the sacrifice he has made for you on the cross, you know the heaven that is waiting for you, you know the forgiveness that is yours in Christ, the grace and mercy that are with you every day. Because you know these things in Christ, you can tell your soul, be still. Which is just another way of saying, don't be afraid. Few minutes we're going to be singing, Be Still My Soul. And it's something that we can tell ourselves regularly over and over again Be still, my soul, be still. It's okay. God is in charge, God is in control. The God of love and grace who died for me 2,000 years ago is not about to abandon me now. We're going to be okay. Even in this messy world, even when things seem like they're not going great or even less than that, they're going terrible. At the same time, there's still hope because we have Christ. Paul's emphasizing this to Timothy in the second half of our text when he writes, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Right there, in verse 9, you have some incredible comfort. He saved us. Now, he will, maybe, possibly in the future save us. No, this is present reality right now. You are saved right now. And not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Our salvation, our status as loved and redeemed children of God, does not depend on your performance. God loving you and forgiving you isn't going to be decided whether you've had a really good week or a really bad week. And that's a comfort. Especially with those who find themselves afraid. Does God really... This last week, and it's, it's somebody that my mom has talked to me about before, Dear old lady, never really officially a member of my dad's church in Hillsboro, but a, a regular attender with her husband who was a member. And she spent too much of her adult life fearful. I hope when I die, God will accept me into heaven. I think I've done enough. And whenever she would be there and if she would start talking to dad and dad would very lovingly like, no, 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 no. Did Christ die for you? Well, yeah. Is Christ's grace big enough to cover your sin? Well, well, yeah. Has God promised that he's going to forgive you or that he has forgiven you for the sake of his son? Well, well, Yeah. Did Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Well, yeah. You're okay. Marguerite, you're okay. God loves you. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. It's not about your performance. And it's not about your performance. You don't have to worry about getting into heaven because you've done enough. You get into heaven because Christ has done enough. Because of his mercy and grace, he gifts you life. This grace was given us in Christ before the beginning of time. One of the mind-bending realities of all of this, and this gets into God's providence and, 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 and God's eternal nature, and, and this is something we could spend a whole lot of time trying to dive into, but we won't this morning. 
is that mind-bending reality that God already from the beginning foresaw and knew what he was going to do. Which for you can be a comfort because from the very beginning, God has foreseen and known that he's going to love you and he's going to call you to be his child and that through baptism, he's going to name you his own And that through his word and sacrament, he's going to feed and nurture you. Already from the very beginning of time, God knew this. And God's plans are irrevocable. And therefore, so is your hope. Now, This salvation, this grace has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Again, God's words to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. If the words of 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10 are true, Can you walk out of this room this morning with hope? Yeah. Yes, you can. If the words of 2 Timothy 1, 9, and 10 and Joshua 1, 9 are true, can you walk out of this room this morning with a measure of peace and confidence? Yeah, because the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The same God who is gracious, who has called you to a holy life, the same God who has saved you, is going to walk with you every day. Today, tomorrow, and 2022, no matter how great or terrible 2022 is, God is going to be with you wherever you go. And that is a very, very good thing. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus gives you the specific promise. Never alone. Or Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. We've looked at this one before recently. But God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What can a pandemic do to me? What can a politician do to me? What can a recession do to me? What can, whatever the fear is. That's a rhetorical question there, right? It's where the grammar is taking us. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What can a pandemic do to me? Nothing. What can... This is Romans 8 again. The end of Romans 8, right? Neither height nor death, angels or demons, persecuted. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Confidence. Because God is there. Never leaving, never forsaking. Confidence. Hope. Because the Lord of the universe, your gracious God and Savior, walks with you wherever you go. Today, tomorrow, into the new year, and into eternity. Hope dwells where Christ is. And Christ is in you. So be not afraid. Let's pray. Please stand. Lord God, Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power. Guard and keep us. Bless us. Encourage us. Give us hope and strength. We stand once again on the doorstep and threshold of a new year. For many, that is a day, this is a, is a time of hope and optimism. For, for some, it is a time of fear and trepidation. In all, we ask that you would be our hope, that you would quiet our fears, that you would give peace to our souls, 
that you would help us to remember your presence and your grace, your power and your mercy. You are a gracious God who will never leave or forsake. You are a kind God who will never abandon. And so we can enter the new year unafraid. We can enter the new year with hope. For you walk with us now and forever. Be with your church here and throughout the world in the coming year. May it always be a place of hope and rest for those who seek your grace. We ask these things as we ask all things in your name, joining in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn 415. This morning we sing uh, the Koine arrangement of that hymn, which means the uh, text will be up on the screen. Feel free to follow along in your service folder, as well as in a hymnal if you so choose.
Be still my soul The hour is hastening on When we shall be Forever with the Lord When disappointment, grief and fear are gone We rise for the closing prayer and blessing. Eternal Lord of life, through your Son, you have given your people the brightness of your light. Kindle in our hearts and minds a holy desire to shine with the brightness of Christ rising until we feast at the banquet of eternal light through Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you today and always. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude our service with our final hymn, hymn number 70. Hymn number 70.
Once again, good morning, everyone. God's blessings on your week and really our last week here of the current year. Uh, announcements, usual places up on the screen in your service folder online. Thank you again for taking the time to be here with us today. Blessings to have technologically adept people here who can help us troubleshoot as needed. Thank you for that and have a great New Year's week and Lord willing, we'll see you again bright and early in 2022.